Hello and welcome to the Business Today show. I am Udayan Mukherjee. Usually on this show, we get you the big faces from Indian industry and global industry. But my guest today is actually the person who all of these business leaders reach out to when they want to do a major deal, like a merger and acquisition or a restructuring, which is quite major, because she is one of India's top corporate lawyers. Uh, so if you look back and see the big deals which have happened over the last decade or longer, whether it's the Tata's acquisition of Jaguar Land Rover or L&T Mine Tree or K and Vedanta, SoftBank buying a stake in Ola, and more recently the HDFC and HDFC Bank merger even, they all have the blueprint of AZB and partners and more specifically Zia Modi who's managing partner and co-founder of AZB. She is absolutely at the top of her game as one of the brightest stars in the Indian legal firmament and no coincidence that she happens to be the daughter of one of India's uh, most well-known and most loved jurists, the late Soli Sorabji. It gives me great pleasure to welcome on the show today for you uh, the one and only Zia Modi. Zia, it's a pleasure having you on and thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Adan. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Tell us first, is it an exciting time to be a lawyer? I'm a, a top-notch lawyer today in India because there's so much going on in the M&A landscape, foreign direct investment, and even the much spoken about judicial activism uh, in the public space. Uh, is it exciting? Look at my face. Isn't it looking exciting? I think that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the most fascinating periods for any young lawyer to be part of the entire development of corporate M&A, of legal jurisprudence uh, by being a counsel arguing in court or being a young corporate attorney sitting in on a large M&A deal. I think the world has really changed from about 20 years ago where this was not necessarily the first calling of choice. Uh, but now I think that uh, becoming a young lawyer and hoping to aspire and reach the top of your game is very much a possibility and a dream that many youngsters want to dream. And therefore, we are seeing a lot many youngsters join the legal profession than we saw before. So a simple answer to your question is yes. Mm. And we'll probably talk a lot about the corporate aspect of it. But, you know, I don't remember law being such a major part and parcel of public discourse as it is today. I mean, all this talk about uh, the judiciary being actually an offset to the executive. Uh, do, do you agree with all that talk about legal overreach at this point in time? Or do you think it is actually a part of the role of the judiciary uh, to become part of public life as it has become in our country today? So, you know, uh, as, as you well know, and I'm sure as you've researched, uh, there are times when there are troughs and there are peaks of what you call judicial activism. Uh, I, uh, my personal view is that uh, I welcome judicial activism. I think sometimes it can be overreaching where you have uh, courts call back the government week on week and ask them to give them uh, school reports. But other than that, I think that what keeps uh, uh, all three branches in check is the fact that they are ultimately accountable for their behavior and their uh, accountability, so to speak, to the judiciary. There are some things that would never have happened without judicial intervention. You take the writ of habeas corpus, you take the under trials being kept in prison, you take the situation in orphanages, you take so many public interest litigations which have led to change in legislation, uh, better government behavior, and a, a sense of wariness that if you overstep the moral line, the Supreme Court is there to come and ask you to be accountable. Now, you've worked with so many CEOs and managements over the years. Uh, I always wanted to ask you this question. Do you think Indian CEOs and Indian managements innately respect the law or are they always trying to work around it, bend it or tweak it in some way? So as always, there's no one easy answer. There are CEOs today who over the last 10 years, if you ask me, have changed and have recognized that trying to skirt or to be over cute or go too close to the edge is not productive. 
because when the when the regulator comes after you then all this cuteness you have to answer for and so many ceos today actually come and ask what is the course of conduct which is the least risky maybe a little risky but they don't want to ask for the not too risky they don't want to know that right so their risk appetite if you like has reduced which is a change in dna of that culture of the company and of the firm these are larger firms that go to market mm. that have a lot of foreign direct investment in them that have a reputation which needs to be protected and so i have seen this change for sure in these ceos then there are of course the smaller companies where mm. you have a mix there are some that still have a high risk and are willing to face perhaps regulatory intervention and there are some that even when they are smaller they know private equity will come and they will come at a premium if your track is good not if your track is solid so i'm seeing all types actually then mm. so what allows this the preponderance of scams in the corporate uh, environment zia i mean if there is some respect for law at least in the larger companies why do we have so many scams what in the ecosystem is continuing to allow it i think let's look at it practically right in any country in any part of the world if there is a fraud because that's what a scam is right then it's because there are fraudsters all right people who perpetrate that behavior and those people if they land up in companies of uh, which are public or listed uh, or touch a lot of the ecosystem uh, then the problem is that one bad apple starts to give the infection effect to many more that were better behaved and even in america or in europe when you see the the the, the scams that hit the headlines you don't well we oughtn't to rub everybody with the same brush i think the problem here is that when a scam hits the papers or when a scam hits the regulator the problem here is that the the punishment for the scam if you like which will satisfy both the regulator and the public takes too long to deliver and therefore the suggestion is that you know it can keep going on and on and justice will not be done soon enough but i think if you ask me frankly that is also changing the regulator is now aware of the tools it has to bring people to the table and to to behave better there is much more of a fear factor than there was before and i always say fear is good uh, there's nothing wrong with fear if it helps better behavior and therefore i think that you you have the scams but i don't think there's a scam popping up every week i think the problem is when we see our scams there are large proportions and they affect public money and therefore there is a there is a sort of not again kind of thing but if you ask me in the last 5 years the relative bigger scams it's a it's an order of saying it have reduced there's enough time to talk about all of this i want to get back to the start of your story because you started this conversation by talking about a young person as a lawyer were you always going to be a lawyer when you were young because you you were born into a very illustrious legal fold or was there something intrinsically or philosophically attractive about law as a profession which got you in no i don't think at the age of 20 25 i was uh, attracted by the philosophy of law i was actually uh, it was very exciting to see my father as a young girl uh, practice as a lawyer when i was living at home and uh, you know he was in court every day and uh, we used to have dinner together the whole family and at night you would hear all these conversations one side of the conversations with a walkie talkie phone that existed in that time and it was always frenetic energetic uh, argumentative uh, you know having to win uh, fighting everything as a war not a skirmish and so uh, given that i also have a 
quite an argumentative nature. It appealed immediately. And uh, for me, it was almost like an osmosis factor. I don't think I ever wanted to do anything but the law. It must have been heartbreaking to lose your father to COVID last year. Uh, but what, what really have you imbibed from him? I mean, was, it, was he just an inspiration as a young woman? Or are many of the things that you uh, adopt today, use today, are actually his, his, uh, impre the impression that he left behind on you? I think really the value system which he asked me to follow from the first day. So I worked in uh, America for uh, nearly five years at a firm called Baker and McKenzie in New York and came back essentially to get married and came back into another world. Uh, you know, it was Dickensian almost in nature. I shared the desk, which was a small four feet, five feet desk with uh, my senior. Uh, we had uh, no secretary. Uh, it was uh, sweaty and packed and full of papers. And uh, it was starting from scratch. And uh, it was arguing in court as opposed to doing an m and transaction that I was doing in New York. And so my father was in Delhi. I was in Bombay. So we never really got to practice in the same city. But, you know, he would always tell me that... Don't forget that the ultimate person you are arguing before is the judge and that you are always an officer of the court and that your client is important, but never more important than your reputation with the judge. And he always used to tell me that, you know, if you say one thing wrong in one matter before one judge, they all have lunch together you will ruin your reputation in one lunch. And therefore, what you were brought up with is you have to do the right thing. That doesn't mean you can't fight heart and soul for your client. But there's a limit beyond which you need not travel. And you ought not to travel. And your sense of self-worth and confidence and your ability to sleep at night without vexing about what you did during the day is far more important than winning that fight with the wrong means. So I've always grown up uh, to, to acknowledge clients as important, but not vitally necessary to my existence if they cross my moral compass. And I think that with those values, the clients in turn respect you because they understand that the moral compass you deliver to them is for their benefit. I mean, I'm not getting anything out of their good behavior, right? I'm just protecting them. And therefore, slowly and surely, as you grow older and fatter and wiser, people take you a little more seriously. So I think that was my one of my father's greatest lessons to me and counsel to me, that just make sure whatever you do, you're able to deliver the advice in a manner that you don't regret delivering it the next day. And what he may or may not have told you in uh, telling you that all these judges have lunch together was that maybe 99% of the judges were men. I mean, you were entering a male bastion because law was a male bastion in India and perhaps in the rest of the world. Uh, what was it like? I mean, uh, I mean, would you tell a young woman who's considering law as a profession today that things are vastly different than when you started uh, uh, this profession or got into it? So uh, it's in two buckets for them. If you ask me today, uh, if you're a practicing counsel or barrister, right, and you're a woman, even today, after so many decades, I would say it is still extremely tough. Uh, I'm not sure I can put my finger on it other than to say that it's a difficult world to break into. And as a woman, it absolutely requires extra time and commitment to show that you are as good as your peer who is a male. I remember when I was a young barrister, I used to, I'm sure, work 30% more than my male counterpart because I was capital P for paranoia. I couldn't afford to make a mistake in court because I was so conscious that I was probably the only woman who was arguing in that matter on that day. So as arguing counsel, not good at all. Uh, I think we have a long way to go. 
I think uh, if you had to allocate why, it would be just partly it's very, very hard to be dancing and prancing and acting day after day uh, for eight hours a day, preparing for another five hours at night for the next day and managing to multitask as a woman everything around you without the essential infrastructure and ecosystem. As a corporate lawyer or as a non-litigating lawyer, it has become much easier for women. Not terribly easy, but much easier. And that is simply because I think that in today's world, everybody, men and women, need talent. They really need talent. And if they need talent, then women are talent. And so you can't afford to just let any bright woman drop off the landscape and just fade away from the firm without making that effort to retain and keep that incredible source of talent. So there it's getting better. You know, earlier in the discussion, we spoke about private equity. And, you know, you've been at the forefront of many of these deals, which has actually lit up the landscape over the last couple of years. The number of unicorns India has created because of private equity money uh, coming into many of these digital enterprises. I mean, you were in the SoftBank Ola deal as well, uh, personally. But what do you make of this trend? Because, you know, I was speaking to a person you know well, Ronnie Skruwala. You did the Disney UTV deal as well. And he said, you know, private equity can become a, an end in itself. I mean, that becomes the game rather than uh, focusing on the business. Uh, would you sound a word of caution as well, uh, given the kind of valuations which are being drummed up by this private equity infusion in India today? You can't have it both ways, right? You can't say, I want these incredible valuations and then not welcome the person who's going to give them to you. So I think it's a mix between where the promoter wants to draw his or her own line and the private equity that is willing to bet on you. For the young unicorns, the private equity are betting on individuals, on people who will have the energy to turn the value that they give into even higher values. And I think that uh, in today's world where, you know, uh, India is getting a very nice share of the wallet from all the people, from all private equity. Uh, it's really one where there are too few deals and a lot more money chasing those deals. And therefore the value goes up. You take a promoter like Ronnie that has been successful time and again and has basically been able to create these incredibly valuable institutions and companies. So people are betting on him, right? And the young people that he's working with. So if they give the value, then they expect an exit. And that's the rule of the game, that if you want a value which is great, you give me an exit that is greater. And so that cycle and that merry-go-round goes on. But I think that private equity has proved immensely important and valuable to the country because it has allowed the world to recognize our companies. And it has put a value on our companies that didn't exist 10 years ago. So today, when you see our mid-sized companies, not even our necessarily our listed ones, but our young entrepreneurs and our mid-sized companies, getting the sort of money that they are getting, that can only be good. And if the exit is something that the private equity asks for, you negotiate it, you get the best deal you can. And then that's the price of the money. Mm. Now, I also want to ask you about some of these big deals which are happening in the disinvestment landscape. Uh, I don't know whether you were involved in any of the major mandates which the government recently put out, but Air India got done. And now the government is trying to sell a BPCL. The, now, what kind of legal bedrock is important to get these transactions done, uh, Zia, in your eyes? Because you know, on one hand, you're trying to sell BPCL. On the other hand, the government stops retail prices of fuel being raised in deregulated fuels for a very long period of time, leading to huge losses for uh, the existing companies. Do you think some of these kind of legal provisions need to change uh, to be able to attract really quality bidders for some of these government assets? Uh, uh, the basic legal provisions need to be in place. Yeah, I think the government's been pretty smart. So we represented Tata in the Air India deal, right? And ultimately, the government 
to mm. my mind, behaved like a private party transacting. So if the entire debt burden would not have been able to be taken over to get a good bid, they dealt with that, right? They dealt with that. When it came to unions and employees, they dealt with that. So I think that uh, the disinvestment arm of the government has figured that for best value, they've got to give an attractive deal. Now, when you're talking about BPCL, if the losses continue and the deregulation uh, and the pricing does not get resolved, the government's just not going to get a good price. So when it comes to showtime, as they say, uh, at least in the Air India deal, uh, as uh, 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 on the Tata side, I thought that the government ultimately entered into a set of practical commercial negotiations and each party went away feeling that the deal was wholesome enough for them to move forward. If you don't give a good deal, you won't get bidders for them. That's the long and the short of it. Uh, you've also been part of important IBC deals, the bankruptcy code deals like Tata Steel and Bhushan Steel. Uh, do you think uh, something better needs to be in place in terms of the IBC code to facilitate more such transactions? Uh, I mean, as a lawyer, what would your advice be? Because that's such an important part of getting the banking system uh, up and running today. So my partner, Behram Vakili, the B in the AZB, really runs that vertical. But uh, my, my takeaway is that it was an incredibly enabling statute. Look at what was there before, all right? And look what's happened since then. Today, the main thing that the IBC code has brought about is better behavior. No promoter really thought he had to pay back the banks before. No promoter really thought that even his grandson would have to pay back the banks before. Personal guarantees were given knowing that they would never be enforced. So the IBC, first of all, has made a lot of promoters realize that over-leveraging is not a good thing. A lot of people have gone back into selling assets and deleveraging. That is one. The next thing is the IBC code has had many amendments along the way, all of which have been coming out of situations that have occurred, litigation that has happened. I mean, even when we represented Tata in the Bhushan deal, there were court litigations. So many things had to get resolved, right? How much of the previous liability had to be given up or had to be gangasnaz, as they say? What are the other issues which are practical on the ground? What was the ineligibility of every bidder, whether he could bid or not bid? And I think the Supreme Court in the last five years has been incredible in bringing some certainty to the entire jurisprudence in the IBC. Can there be a little more done? Yes. But is it being done? Yes. I think the IBC is being constantly refreshed, if you ask me, constantly refreshed. And I think refreshed for the better every time. There are committees which are set up whenever there's some hiccup or when there's an obvious fallacy in jurisprudence or an obvious fallacy in the drafting. And so I think the good part about this is that the government recognizes the IBC as a work in progress. I'm very enthused about it, actually. And if you look at what has it achieved, uh, look at the number of large uh, companies that you never thought would get into IBC, that have actually been put into IBC and resolved. And therefore, look at the preemptive behavior, the preemptive, yeah. the, the bad behavior that you have preempted, which I think is a goal in itself. Okay. My last question to you, of course, is uh, having worked with so many top industrialists over the last couple of decades longer. Uh, if you had to single out one or two people who really struck you as men of impeccable integrity, people you admire and look up to, who would, who would those be? I think quite a few, not one or two. I think that my interactions with Mr. Tata have been fantastic. Not many of them, but fantastic. Always clear-headed and the refrain was always, what is the right thing that we should do? I think that has been the DNA of the group for as long as I can remember. Uh, there are other houses which uh, have been absolutely exciting to work for, just in their intellectual brilliance and their execution. 
but I would say if I have a fondness for one group, it would be the house. Zia, it has been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much for taking time out today. Most welcome. Thank you.